continuing our study to the book of Exodus, and we were at Exodus chapter 4. In Exodus chapter 3, we had Moses before the burning bush, and we were thinking together about four points of application in being better used to the Lord. And we saw that just like Moses, we need to grow in our understanding of the essential holiness of God. Uh, secondly, we realize that it's God who initiates. He came down that we can come to him and then go for him. It's a great opportunity to go for him. Uh, thirdly, we have to answer identification questions. Who are we? In the work of the Lord, it doesn't matter. All that matters is that God is with us. And then the second question is, who is the Lord? And we won't serve a Lord. We won't love, worship a God that we don't know. So it's important that we have biblical knowledge of who God actually is, not create some figment of our imagination concerning who God is. And fourthly, realizing that God supplies for his work. Um, the Lord's work done his way will not lack his resources. And God was going to provide everything the Israelites needed uh, to serve and worship him once he had delivered them from Egypt. In chapter 4, we have a few objections by Moses. It's going to have three objections. I don't believe that this is a matter of um, rejecting God's command to go to Egypt. I think that was settled back in chapter 3, verse 13. Moses was going, but he really felt inadequate in going. And so his objections should be understood at that, in that light. Uh, he doubted his ability to be the deliverer. That God wanted him to be. He doubted his ability to confront the most powerful man in the world in delivering Israelites from um, slavery and also from the land. Oswell Chambers reminds us that unguarded strength is a double weakness. And so we see Moses' humility in this chapter. He didn't think highly of himself. Um, but Thinking too highly of ourself in the work of the Lord is just as bad as uh, understanding that God um, is able to use whoever he wants uh, in the work. And so trying to thwart the plan of, of God because we feel inadequate is also wrong. Moses' first objection is um, given to us in verse 1 of chapter 4. Then Moses answered and said, but suppose they will not believe me or listen to my voice. Suppose they say the Lord has not appeared to you. So the Lord said to him, Moses, what is in your hand? And he said, a rod. And he said, cast it on the ground. So he cast it on the ground and it became a serpent and Moses fled from it. Then the Lord said to Moses, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. And he reached out his hand and caught it and it became a rod in his hand that they might believe, that's Israel, that they might believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. I love the way that uh, the Lord um, begins with Moses. He's young in his faith. He's just been introduced to Jehovah God. And the Lord starts out with a very easy question. What's in your hand? And Moses looks at a rod. Uh, cast it on the ground, and it became a serpent. And then God tells Moses, uh, pick up the, the serpent uh, by the safe end, the tail, and again, it turned back into a rod. Throughout Scripture, a rod represents power, and Moses' rod then will become a symbol of God's authority and power over what he is uh, executing, his sovereignty. In this case, it will be seen over the land of Egypt and each of the plagues that God brings about in the land, the rod will be used. And so um, <clears throat> I don't believe that signs were to build up Moses' faith in this matter. Uh, the signs were given to the nation of Israel to believe. Paul tells the Corinthian church uh, in his first epistle in chapter 1, verse 22, that the, the Jews have always been sign seekers. Um, the Lord says in the Gospel of Matthew that this is an evil generation that's looking for signs. Um, signs don't build up our faith. 
Um, the signs in this case were proof to Israel that Moses actually was um, coming as God had told him to do and had God's authority. He gives him a second sign in verse 6. Furthermore, the Lord said to him, Now put your hand in your bosom. And he put his hand in his bosom. And when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous like snow. And he said, God said, put your hand into your bosom again. So he, Moses, put his hand in his bosom again and drew out his bosom. And behold, it was restored like the other flesh. Then it will be, if they do not believe you, nor heed the message of the first sign, that they may believe the message of the latter sign. And it shall be, if they do not believe even these two signs, or listen to your voice, that you shall take water from the river, pour it out on dry land. The water which you take from the river will become blood on the dry land. The second sign um, that God gives Moses, he was to stick his hand in his bosom, and he pulls it out, it was leprous. And he says, stick it into your bosom again. Moses sticks it in, pulls it out, um, and his hand is restored to its natural flesh-like texture and content. Uh, no parent disease at all. The, the hand speaks of what we do. The bosom or the heart speaks of what we are. And there's a, a tie between the hand and the heart. The hand does what the heart is. And so if leprosy speaks of wickedness and sin, if, if the heart is wicked, uh, that's the kind of behavior that the hand will exhibit. If the heart is pure and holy, then that's what the hands will represent in their works, is cleanness and holiness. <coughs> Excuse me. And so there is a lesson here for Moses. He is going to have to uh, pursue, have a holy heart, a clean and pure heart before the Lord in order to represent him rightly in Egypt. And likewise, it would serve as a second sign to Egypt that, um, or the nation of Israel in Egypt, that God had sent Moses. The third sign, by the way, a great verse for that is Isaiah 52, 1. A clean heart guides holy conduct. And uh, that's what Moses would learn. He murdered with those hands previously. Now his hands needed to be consecrated to the Lord in holiness. In verse 9, the third sign is, uh, he would take water from the Nile. The Egyptians worshipped the Nile. They revered it as God, the, a God, the life-giving uh, source of the Nile, is what um, made the Egyptians prosper. They, they believed that um, without the Nile they would die. And so um, God will take a strike at the, the Nile River, uh, turning water into blood would bring death. And he was showing that it wasn't the Nile that gives life. It was him, and he had the power over life and death, not the Nile. And, of course, that is going to come out in the very first plague when Aaron will take Moses' rod, strike the water, it turns to blood, and causes great death throughout Egypt. That brings us to the second objection. The first objection was, Lord, they're not going to believe I came in your name. So the signs that God gave Moses was to help the, the elders of Israel believe that Moses was speaking for God and was under his authority. The second objection had to do with Moses himself. He says to the Lord in verse 10, O oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither before nor since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. So the Lord said to him, Who is made? man's mouth, or who makes the mute, the deaf, seeing, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with your mouth, and teach what you shall say. The Lord was just reminding Moses that he was the great creator. He had created Moses. He knew every detail about Moses, his weaknesses, his strengths. And Moses was right. He was not eloquent in speech. He was slow in speech, uh, slow in tongue. And that's why God had chosen him. He was meek. Um, 
We're reminded in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 that God uses the weak things to confound the mighty. He uses the foolish to confound the wise. And Moses was just the type of person that God wanted to use in Egypt to bring Pharaoh down, release his people, but at the same time exalt Jehovah God. If Moses had been a great orator, then he would have gotten the glory. But he wasn't. And so God had chose him. If you feel like you don't have much to offer the Lord, you're not very uh, eloquent, uh, skilled, have a lot of resources, whatever. You're just the kind of person that God is looking for to honor himself. Uh, he honors faithfulness and obedience above all. And he could use rocks and trees to bring himself glory, but he, tent, but he chooses to use those who are redeemed um, to honor himself as uh, vessels of um, mercy uh, being prepared for glory. So, um, Paul also reminds the Corinthians, what do you have that you aren't given? And the answer is nothing. And again, God has made us just the way that he wants us to be. Everything comes down from him. And so we can't question what he wants us to do by inserting that we're not able or capable. Uh, he knows what he can do through us if we uh, go on with him. The third objection, uh, you can see Moses as he's um, conversing with the Lord, he's, he just feels his inadequacies. And he basically, the text says, oh my Lord, please sin by the hand of whomever else you may sin. And basically what Moses is saying is, oh Lord, send a better man than I. Perhaps you felt like that too. Uh, send a better man than I. Well, God has been very gracious with Moses, long-suffering. He's been answering his objections, uh, helping him think through things rationally. And uh, But we read in verse 14, So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, Is not Aaron the Levite your brother? I know that he can speak well, and look, he is also coming out to meet you. When he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. Now, you shall speak to him, Put the words in his mouth, and I will be with your mouth and with his mouth, and I will teach you what you shall do. So he shall be your spokesman to the people, and he himself shall be as a mouth for you, and you shall be to him as God. And you shall take his rod in your hand, with which you shall do the signs. So this is a wonderful verse. We see the character of God. He's a God of love. Uh, anger is a secondary emotion to God. He's not an angry God, but um, he does get angry, and anger is not a sin. It's what the behavior that uh, anger motivates, which can be a sin, or it can exalt God. And here we see God's anger had to be kindled. We know what that is. You take leaves and twigs and paper, you start a fire, then you add something a little bigger to it, and then some logs, and before long you've got a blaze, but it takes time. Uh, God's anger needs to be kindled. He's slow to anger, quick to forgive. And might I add, so should we be. And um, But the beautiful thing about this is God already knew Moses' objections, and he already knew what Moses needed to help him along, and that was Aaron. And so even while God is speaking to Moses, still on Mount Sinai uh, from chapter 3, Aaron is on his way from Egypt. It would take some time to get there. And Aaron was already on his way. And this is the thing I, I so appreciate about the Lord. Uh, he's not limited in any capacity. He's working all sides of a matter at the same time. He can work both ends to bring about his will. So here we see he's working with Moses and he's working with Aaron. And um, he works with Saul and he works with Ananias uh, to bring Saul the Holy Spirit and uh, to heal his blindness in Damascus. He works with Philip and he works with the Ethiopian eunuch. The Ethiopian eunuch is searching the scriptures. Um, an angel tells Philip to go down in the desert, and they meet. And the 
eunuch comes to Christ. Uh, Peter and Cornelius, another great example of this. Cornelius, um, God is working with him, a just man, a devout man, a Gentile, and he's told to send messengers down to Joppa to find a man named Peter in the house of uh, Tanner uh, in Joppa. And at the same time, um, God gives Peter this vision of the sheet with unclean animals in it, rise and eat. And so Peter is going to learn that the Gentiles are not unclean. Uh, what God says is unclean is unclean. What God said is holy is holy. So he's working both sides of it. And we know the end of that wonderful story in Acts chapter 10. Peter goes, he preaches the word, and Cornelius' house and friends come to Christ. And uh, it's a wonderful conclusion. So our God is not limited. He works both sides of the matter. Now, this is going to cost Moses something. Because he balked at going on with the Lord alone, Aaron was brought into the work, which meant Aaron was going to get some of the glory, some of the honor associated with the work. And that's always the case. If we balk at the calling of God and what he wants us to do, He'll bring somebody else into the work, or he'll use somebody else to do it. And I think that's the, the thought uh, when the Lord Jesus is speaking to the church of Philadelphia in Revelation chapter 3, when he says, don't let anyone take your crown. God's going to get the work done one way or another. If we choose not to do what God has called us, called us to do, he'll use somebody else, and they'll get the reward that we would have gotten. So we need to be faithful to the Lord. Um, Moses is going to lose some honor and glory. It's going to go to Aaron because of this. Now, with that said, I don't want to be too hard on Moses. Um, it's quite interesting when we get into the New Testament and the book of Hebrews, that when the writer is talking about Moses and his faithfulness as a servant to God, in chapter 3, verse 5, he speaks of Moses as a therapon. A devout, a devoted servant. Uh, doulos is a normal Greek word used for a bond servant or a slave in the New Testament. But that's not the word used for Moses. Moses was a therapon, a, devote, uh, a devout uh, servant of the Lord. And uh, he's the only one in the entire New Testament that is accredited to that term. Uh, clearly, the Lord Jesus was devoted to doing his father's will, but the Greek text does not specifically call him a therapon, only Moses. So it shows us that Moses did finish well. He's just starting in his faith. Uh, he'll have the next 40 years to serve the Lord, and he'll do many things for the Lord and uh, grow in his faith. In verse 18, we read, So Moses went and returned to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said, Please let me go and return to my brethren who are in Egypt, and see whether they are still alive. And Jethro said to Moses, Go in peace. This was proper to do. Jethro was the authority of the clan. And so Moses takes his marching orders from Jehovah. He is under authority. And so he speaks to that authority, and Jethro agrees to let him go. Verse 19, now the Lord said to Moses, Midian, go return to Egypt for all the men who sought your life are dead. That had to be good news for Moses. Certainly he was wondering if they were still seeking to kill him because of the Egyptian that he had killed 40 years earlier. But that was not the case. All those who sought his life earlier had passed away. Then Moses took his wife and his sons and set them on a donkey, one donkey, and he returned to the land of Egypt. Moses took the rod of God in his hand. And the Lord said to Moses, When you go back to Egypt, see that you do all those wonders before Pharaoh, which I have put in your hand. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. So God was affirming his relationship to the nation of Israel. He had created them, and he considered them like a firstborn son to them. They were to represent him on earth as a special, peculiar people among the Gentile nations. So I say to you, let my son go, that he may serve me. 
But if you refuse to let him go, indeed, I will kill your son, your firstborn. And that was very prophetic because in the 10th plague, that's what happened. Pharaoh's son was killed in the plague that smote the firstborn of all of Egypt, uh, from the Egyptians all the way down to the animals. Now, I want to call your attention to verse 20. It says, Then Moses took his wife and his sons and set them on a donkey. Um, we know that Gershom was Moses' first son, and that means to be a stranger. And Moses felt his strangership in the, the land of Midian. That not, was not his calling. It awakens him to the fact he's a pilgrim and a stranger. Um, he needs to be among his own people worshiping uh, his God. Um, I would like to suggest to you that, um, that the second son, Eliezer, which means God is my help, was probably a newborn or maybe one year of age, uh, very young at this time. You have two boys and mom on one donkey, so that tells me the boys weren't very old. And as we come into the final verses of this chapter, then it makes sense um, what um, makes sense with the dialogue, what was happening here, and that Eliezer was probably uh, very young. Now, I'll just say that these next few verses are some of, I say this in a very reverent way, some of the most bizarre verses in Scripture. Verse four, uh, 24, And it came to pass on the way at the encampment to the Lord that the Lord met him and sought to kill him. Let me read that again. And it came to pass on the way at the encampment. They hadn't gone very far that the Lord, from Jethro's um, encampment, that the Lord met him and sought to kill him, kill Moses, kill, kill his deliverer. Then Zephorah took a sharp stone, cut off the foreskin of her son, and cast it at Moses' feet, and said, Surely you are a husband of blood to me. So he let him go. The Lord let Moses go. Then she said, You are a husband of blood because of the circumcision. Uh, very unusual circumstances here. You would say, well, Moses is doing what he's supposed to do. He's got the rod of God in his hand. He's got his wife, his two sons on a donkey, and off he's going to Egypt in obedience to the Lord's command. But there was something in Moses' household that was not right, and God knew all about it. The Midianites did not practice circumcision, and apparently Gershom was circumcised as a boy, a baby, because uh, he's not uh, discussed in this chapter. But uh, this must have been a contention between Zephora and Moses, and when their second son was born, Moses had neglected to circumcise him. And um, you can, we understand how when moms and dads or in disagreement on something, sometimes dads can just give in to it to keep peace. But this is not keeping keep peace with the Lord. The Lord had given a command, and uh, Moses was a Hebrew. His sons needed to be circumcised. Um, it's far back as Genesis 17, all the descendants of Abraham were to be circumcised, all the boys. And so uh, God had uh, not overlooked that detail. Moses had. And so to get his attention, God, as some of the commentators think, struck Moses with pestilence. Others think that he was being strangled by the Lord. In either case, it forces Sephora to pick up the knife and do the circumcision. Not that she wanted to, but she was forced to in order to save the life of her husband. And she's not happy about it. Um, you're a bloody husband. Well, it was the Lord's doing. Moses had neglected obedience in this matter, and so he was getting things in order before he went to Egypt. The Lord was getting his house in order, forcing him to get his house in order. Um, and then as soon as the boy is circumcised, the Lord lets Moses go. He's restored. Now this has um, great ramifications concerning application for us today. 
we cannot expect to do great things for the Lord unless our homes are where they need to be before the Lord. If there is an order and obedience in the home, how can we expect the Lord to give us greater things to do for him? The home is the testing ground, really. Uh, we see that for qualifications and characteristics, validation of elders. Um, the home, their children, their disposition of their wives, and so forth are uh, telltale signs of a man who has his uh, home in order and therefore can be an overseer within the, the church meeting. So if we expect to do great things for the Lord, we can't think that neglecting the little things is going to um, help us out in that. We need to have everything in order uh, within our homes for us to have greater opportunity to serve the Lord. We're picking up now in chapter 4, verse 27. All this had a very uh, sobering effect on Moses. He sends Zephora and his two sons back to Jethro. Uh, he will continue on. He meets Aaron in the Mount of the Lord. And then the two brothers will go on to Egypt. So we read in verse 27, The Lord said to Aaron, Go into the wilderness to meet Moses. So he went and met him in the mountain of God, on the mountain of God and kissed him. So Moses told Aaron all the words of the Lord who had sent him and all the signs which he had commanded. Then Moses and Aaron went and gathered together all the elders of the children of Israel. And Aaron spoke all the words which the Lord had spoken to Moses. Then he did the signs in the sight of the people. So the people believed. And when they heard that the Lord had visited the children of Israel, and that he had looked on their afflictions, they bowed their heads and worshipped. So this is a lovely ending to this chapter. Moses and Aaron, two brothers, go on to Egypt. Uh, they show the signs to the elders of Israel. They deliver the message. Jehovah God is watching. His timetable has come about. His promise to Abraham will be fulfilled you're going to be delivered from slavery and brought out of the land to have a special relationship with Jehovah God, the God of your fathers, and he's going to take you and bring you into a land fill, filled with milk and honey. So the elders believed, and it says they bowed their heads and worshipped. Um, again, just a lovely ending to a, a chapter. Father, we thank you for what we've learned in this chapter. We pray that we would not balk at your calling. Uh, we know that you're the one who's created us and you've given us um, the necessary abilities to do what you've called us to do with your help. And so we pray we'd be settled in that. And uh, we just pray that we would go on with you. And Lord, we're thankful for this note of application about uh, being faithful in the little things in order to receive greater ways of honoring you. And uh, we pray, Father, especially for those dads and husbands, that they, they're accountable for their homes and that they would lead uh, their homes in a way that would be honoring to you, not compromising any uh, part of your order or commands in order to have a greater um, opportunity to serve you and things outside the home. So we're thankful for this uh, text. Please help us to learn from it. We ask in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.